We're going to be talking about uh, data types and basic variable manipulation. So we're really um, diving straight into the basics of how to use R. We're going to cover four things. Uh, one, we're going to talk a little bit about how to use outside resources, meaning non-course resources in here, because uh, you can very easily get yourself down a confusing rabbit hole if you're not careful. Two, talk about how to use DataCamp in an effective way, because there are certain features of DataCamp that are not super obvious uh, if you are looking for them. Uh, three, going to cover highlights from that introduction to R piece, which is really just a kind of a formal lecture kind of approach to uh, some of the things that I think you need to really pay the most attention to, which at this point is almost everything, uh, so we'll very briefly go through a lot of concepts. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about some new skills related to the project this week that's mostly just using R Studio. Um, because you're going to be, for the project this week, you're going to be creating an RStudio project. You're going to be uh, responding to several prompts related to the uh, skills that you learned in the introduction to R unit, uh, and then turning in that entire package uh, into Blackboard. All right. Outside resources. There are two kinds of outside resources that you might use in the class, uh, one of which I would recommend and one of which I would not yet, but later. The resource I would recommend right now are cheat sheets. So what cheat sheets are, are basically documents that people have consolidated a lot of uh, commands and information about how to use some particular aspect of the R language or Python or whatever else into a single PDF in most cases. Uh, oh, slight changes, by the way, to the course. Within course resources, slides are now available on Blackboard. Uh, this week's are not up yet, but last week's are, and I'll probably go in that pattern moving forward. Um, so they should be up later today. Uh, so cheat sheets, I'll show you one of them. Uh, we have the R, basic R cheat sheet. Uh, this is that link that I provided. In that first link, you'll actually see a list of cheat sheets, many more than this one. Uh, but this is the one that's been, that covers the topics that you would have looked at this, um, in this last module. So you can see a lot of stuff that we've already, uh, it hopefully looks familiar. Uh, basic packages, which we talked about uh, last class, uh, vector subsetting, which we'll talk about today, it should have been in, your, in the uh, thing you looked at, uh, vector creation, we haven't done most of that yet, did a little bit of loops, uh, and so on. But these kind of documents are really valuable to have on hand as you're learning. Uh, so as we start, this basic R one is probably going to be the most useful to you, but as we move forward, you'll start, this will all become very second nature, you won't need to refer to this anymore, and other cheat sheets will replace it. Uh, that have more custom inf uh, information customized to what we're covering. Uh, so that first link right there is a whole list of cheat sheets. Uh, I would not recommend looking too far forward because you will be more confused than helped. Uh, so right now, stick to the base R. Uh, outside websites, uh, there are a lot of websites where they talk about R. Uh, you'll see stuff, for example, on uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, you will see stuff uh, on... Uh, it's, actually, it's a very large list. So if you start Googling around for how to do blank in R, uh, you will find a lot of resources. Right now, don't do that, because that will lead you to all sorts of alternative conceptualizations and advanced programmer ways of doing things and ways to save time, etc., which you really don't want right now because it will just be more confusing. So don't, don't start Googling around at this point. Stick to what's, what we talk about in here and what's in the uh, data camp lesson. For now, that'll change it a little bit later. All right, data camp. So remember, R is actually running. And I think that's an important thing to uh, remember because otherwise you might not realize you can do things that you can do. So for example, if you were presented with this prompt right here, uh, which is one of the pieces that you should have done for uh, the assignment, at the top right there it says planets underscore df and rings underscore vector are preloaded in your workspace. So that means that a thing you should do here is use R to get information about the things preloaded in your workspace, right? So for example, if I go down here and just type planets underscore df, it will give me that data frame. You don't have to do everything in this and just keep hitting submit answer until it works. That's a very inefficient way to do this. Instead, you want to subset your problems and do it piece at a time. You can even press control enter up there to do one line at a time just to test and see if it works. So don't just rewrite program, submit, didn't work, rewrite program, submit, didn't work over and over again. Do it piece by piece down here. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to mention there. All right. All right. So things you learned. Uh, 
you're going to need these skills for this week's project, but you're more importantly going to need these skills for literally everything else we do in here. Uh, this is really the fundamental building blocks of syntax in R. How do you refer to variables? How do you make assignments? How do you do comparisons, etc.? cetera? Um, there's a lot of slides of this, so we'll go through them one at a time to make sure that you caught it. Uh, these two up here at the top are the most important things in R. This is called, which I didn't tell you, the assignment operator. And it is how you assign a value to a variable, okay? That first one, actually both of those, uh, that first one is not less than minus. That second one is not equals. Do not say equals in your head when you see that symbol, because that is not equals. These are both pronounced gets. So if you see a variable name and that symbol two, like you see x and that symbol two, then in your head you should say, think to yourself, x gets two. Don't think x equals. Because if you confuse that, later down the road when you actually try to do comparisons, you will use that equals incorrectly. Because that is gets. These comparators right here, you did uh, less than and greater than, right? And what happens when you do less than or greater than? What does it tell you? What does that return? True or false, Boolean values. So the problem is, if you use just equals, you're using assignment, you're not using comparison. To actually compare if x is equal to y, you use two equals in a row, okay? So that's why that is not equals. That's why that symbol is gets. Do not confuse them. A very common early error that people make is that they use an equals and they use a gets instead of an equals. And the reason that that's hard to diagnose is because it will not throw an error. It will work. Because the value of x gets 4 is always true, because it worked. So that will always return true, even if these two values are not actually equal. Does that make sense? So, gets, in your head, gets, not equals. Yeah? That still gets. They're, they're both assignment op the, the assignment operator. They are identical except in certain situations. So the difference is that the, uh, the less than based assignment operator can only be used as its own command, whereas you'll see that, that other assignment operator inside statements sometimes. You can't, you can't use the first one inside a statement. So we'll see examples of that. But otherwise, it's the same. Yeah. Uh, yes, the equals base gets, you can use that all the time. You actually never need the, uh, your assignment operator. Mm -hmm. uh, it is generally good form, though, because of the reasons I just described. <laughs> yeah, easily confused. Uh, this is also, you might remember from last time I talked about there's an R way to do things. So using the, e the, uh, se the equal symbol as your gets operator is not the R way of doing things. So in programs, you'll typically see the other. Uh, these guys, you did less than, greater than. I mentioned this is equals. This is not equals. This character right here, what is that? It is not an exclamation point. What is that? It looks like an exclamation point, doesn't it? When you're a programmer, that's called bang. This is bang equals. Okay? So I will say that a lot. I will not call that an exclamation point, and we will see it many times in the future. Okay. Uh, da -da -da. Output. This is an important rule, which is not always obvious. Output does not get assigned to a variable unless you tell it so. If I just type the letters, uh, if, I, if I take a data frame and I add 4 to the data frame, it does not assign 4 back to the data frame. All it does is it adds them together, and then it spits it out in the output for you. You have to use assignment to get that to save somewhere. So let's see if we can do an example real quick. Uh, if I have x plus 4, I need an x, x gets 4, x is value 4, and I do x plus 4, it spits out 8. But what is x? It is still 4. So that leads to a lot of times you'll see a construction that looks like this, x gets x plus 4. That's more obvious right now, but when you get to data frames, it's easy to forget. When you start doing things like summarizing data frames into rows and getting output history, you have to save that output in order to keep it. Otherwise, it just disappears forever. It stays in the console and never goes anywhere else. OK, those are basics. Data types. You will sometimes see the term atomic class for this. Atomic classes include Numeric, logical, factor, character, and complex. We didn't talk about complex. This is for imaginary numbers. We don't use it much in stats. 
So numeric, two types. I mentioned one last time, floating point, which has a decimal place, and integers, which have no decimals. Uh, sometimes you will see this indicator right here, this capital L to indicate an integer. It doesn't actually mean anything other than to force an integer. So for example, if I just type 4L, it's a 4. <laughs> but that's a 4 to indicate it's a 4 as an integer. You see, if I try to treat it incorrectly, I put a floating point value in front of the L to indicate integer, it gives me a warning. It says that's not right. But note, it does not throw an error. It still returns an output. It still returns 4.5. It just said, mm, you didn't mean to do that. Learn to pay attention to errors. We get in really bad habits as novice casual computer users to say, oh, look, there's an error. OK, without reading the error without parsing what it means, without trying to figure out where it came from. That is a habit you need to break. In this case, if you see this warning, even if you got output, even if you have results, and this is really important for stats especially, if you have results but see a warning, then pay attention to the warning. It could be very important. Okay. So those are numeric values. Uh, we also have logic, also called Boolean values. Always all caps, true or false. These are called reserved words. What a reserved word means is that this is a word used in the R programming language for one purpose and one purpose only, and you cannot repurpose it. Now, importantly, yeah, I'll do it right here. If I type true, I get true. If I type lowercase true, I get error. True is a reserved term. Note, I can do true gets false, and then when I type true, I get false. However, I can't type true gets false because it recognizes that's a reserved word and is not allowed to be a variable name, okay? Now, why that's important is because there are very few reserved words in R. You can accidentally overwrite a function with whatever you want. So there's a function called mean. Actually, you can't overwrite mean. There's a, a function that you... I think you used a function in there before. You use cbind. I think you can actually overwrite cbind. Let's hop down. I'm going to cbind old cbind. I've actually never actually tried this. So we'll find out. cbind gets true. Ha! We did it. cbind is a way that you add a column to a data frame. And I just wrote, rewrote that entire function and made it return true. Because cbind is not a reserved word. That's the difference between a reserved and a non-reserved word. You can overwrite a lot of things you don't really want to overwrite in R. <laughs> so... When you have to create your own variable names, which will happen later, check first to see that if it's something else. Because if it's something else, you don't want to replace it. Okay. I just I got rid of cbind. No, we don't need cbind later. So until I restart R, cbind is going to be redefined as true, which is very bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, factors. Factors are kind of a weird data type. Uh, they come specifically from the fact that R was designed by statisticians. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a strange thing to exist because it really is actually another data type. And you can actually decompose factors into other data types, which makes it kind of a weird hybrid thing. Uh, in fact, if you use type of, which is the way to figure out the function that you use to figure out what kind of atomic class something is, on a factor, it will usually return integer. Because what happens when you assign something to be a factor is it will take all of the labels, it will recode them as numbers, and then give them labels with the text that they previously were. So if you, for example, have experimental and control as two labels in a variable, and you call it a factor, what it's going to do behind the scenes is renumber that one and two, and then assign the, the label experimental to one. No, it'll assign the label control to one and the label experimental to two because it does it alphabetically. So... It's kind of a weird data type, but you need, you need it because if you want to do analyses like ANOVA-based stuff, then it's going to expect factors. And if you don't have a factor, it's going to throw an error. So we have to use factors. Uh, but usually, yeah, we have this combination. The uh, data type itself is categorical, nominal, ordinal kind of data. Uh, but the value itself will become an integer as a signifier, and then it will have a text label, a, a character-based label. Characters, you're going to use a lot of. Also called strings. In most languages, these are called strings. In R, these are called character vectors. Uh, they are always surrounded by quotes when you define it. Single quote or double quote is fine. You can actually use this as a way to include quotes in a string. 
if you do single quote, double quote, single quote, you now have a string with a double quote in it. Make sense? So if we go back here, uh, da, da, da. you will also notice that R handles this by using backslashes. This is called an escape character, and it's the way that to create special symbols that otherwise you wouldn't be able to create. So, quote, 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 quote. Yeah, it won't work like that. But if I do quote, backslash, quote, backslash, quote, backslash, quote, backslash, quote, quote. Now I have a string with four quotes in it. You see the difference? This is called an escape character. By the way, also important thing that I, re I just remembered that casual web users, or casual, casual computer users don't always remember, forward slash and backslash are different. So which way the top leans? Don't confuse them. So in this case, this is a backslash because the top leans backwards. It's forward slash and the top leans forwards. If you use the wrong one, it won't work. So backslash escapes special characters. That's what's going on right here. And then we have complex. But we, we don't use imaginary numbers in here if you need to do really crazy operations for whatever reason. I mean, I, imaginary is in like I, like back when you had math class, imaginary numbers. Not as in I made them up. All right. So these are all of the data types. Well, pretty much all the data types. Okay. So everything else decomposes. I'm missing these two, sorry. <laughs> everything else decomposes into these data types uh, into these uh, variable types. So factors, I uh, mentioned before, really not very common unless you're doing factor-related analyses. Uh, usually involves redefining a vector of words as a factor using the procedure I just told you. Re it recodes everything as numbers uh, and then uh, has labels. Communicates to R what sort of analysis is permitted. That's really the sole purpose of a factor. It doesn't do anything else. Another variable type you're going to have is a list which combines uh, multiple data types into a single data structure. This guy right here, this bracket versus double bracket is very important. Single brackets subset, double brackets extract. You used both in the intro to R thing, but it didn't really explain what the difference between them was. So if a list contains a matrix, then single brackets one will return a single item list with a matrix in it. That's subsetting. Okay. It gives a portion of the thing you started with. Whereas the double brackets will look at the component itself. So if you do double brackets one, it will take the first list item, get rid of the list. It will just look at that first item. You can also do that with the command unlist, the function unlist. I skipped over. I'm going to go back a minute. Too many slides. Vectors are the most fundamental data type in R. There are vectors everywhere. You can have an integer vector. You can have, or as in a numeric vector. You can have a complex vector. You can have a character vector. All of these data types can be vectorized. However, you cannot have a vector that has more than one data type in it. That is very important. As soon as a vector is defined with a particular data type, you cannot combine it with other data types. So you have a character vector, or you have a numeric vector. You can't have a vector that has both characters and numbers in it. Okay? If you need to do that, you need a list. The list allows whatever you want. Vectors do not. Subsetting is very important. Uh, there are three major ways to subset, uh, which I have noted here, which you need to remember. One is to look at any individual element of a vector, which is just single brackets and the number. Two is to use ranges, which always uses the colon. Five colon ten means items five through ten in this vector. And then this third type right here, what that type does is essentially take, creates a new vector with the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in it, and then it throws that vector into X, the subset. So you're subsetting a vector by a vector. That also illustrates a broader concept that is really important. 
which is that everything returns something. And that thing that's returned, you can do whatever you want with it. That's the flexibility part of R. I can do an operation, assign that to a value, and use that value in another operation, regardless of what it is, 100% of the time, without limitation. So, for example, if I were to create a correlation matrix using a command that creates literally a correlation matrix, I can say, well, you know what? I'm going to return the value, the p-value in the third column and the fourth row, and I'm going to assign that to a new variable and do something else with it. That's the kind of flexibility you have with R. So, to illustrate why that's important is that you, because that means you can nest functions however you want. I can say, let's see, I want a subsetting vector. I'm going to call it numbers 3, 4, and 6. Uh, too many spaces. Now I have a subsetting vector, which has values 3, 4, and 6. I can pass that into another vector. Let's call this vector 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I can do V and subset by subsetting vector. That is identical to replacing that with the same command. Take a moment to parse what just happened. If I can make this bigger. Nope. Oh boy. Oh, there we go. Ah, uh, zoom. All right. So in this case, I created a, a, a vector, in this case a numeric vector, called subsetting v. I created another vector with values 1 through 10, which I could have just as easily done 1 colon 10, same thing. And then I subsetted v using subsetting v. Subsetting v says to take the, use the characters in space 3, 4, and 6. So then when I called v, it looked for the numbers in 3, 4, and 6, which happen to be the values 3, 4, and 6. Okay. So if I change my v, uh, let's do it into 10 to 20. What is this going to return this time? Is that what you expected? It wasn't 13, 14, 16. Why did that happen? It starts with 10. Mm -hmm. So this is a class of error. What you just did is super common. It's called off by one. Off by one errors are the most frustrating thing you will have to deal with when programming. It will all work except it's off by one. And tracking down off by one errors is usually this. It's usually forgetting where the start or the end of something is. And thinking it counts from a different number than it really counts by. This is more complicated in the context of R because R starts with ones, which is unlike every other programming language that you will ever use. Most programming languages start counting from zero. You'll have element zero, element one. In R, element zero exists still but is used for something else, which we won't talk about for a while. So when you count, it always starts with 1. So in this case, we are subsetting with items 3, 4, and 6 in a vector starting with 10. 10, 11, 12, spot 3, and so on. Okay. NA is commonly used for missing values. Uh, and this is actually one of the most nice parts of R that is not like other languages. Because it was written for statisticians, the ability to handle missing values is baked into the very foundations of R. So there's all sorts of stuff available to deal with missing values. But it is coded as an A. We'll not throw an error. That's important. We'll not even throw a warning. It will just throw in an A. So those are vectors. If you understand vectors, then matrices are not that far beyond that. A matrix is really just a multidimensional vector. When you work with matrices, it is very important to remember which is which. This guy right here. Always go down first and then across. For some reason, for years, I had a hard time with this. Because <laughs> I want it to be choose your variable, then choose your case. But it never is. It's choose your case, 
then choose your variable. So this is fourth row, fourth column, not fourth column, fourth row. Remember that. Very important. You can refer to uh, individual subsets of matrices in a lot of different ways. Uh, I would recommend you don't do this third one. This looks like you're subsetting a, a, a vector, and you actually are, because the way that a matrix is represented internally to R is as a gigantic vector organized by columns. So if you have a 4x4, four four, no, yeah, if you have a 2x2 two two matrix and you ask for element 4, it will count 1, 2, 3, 4 and give you the last item in the matrix, second row, second column. So when you subset this way, it's just, you're not, you're probably not going to get the thing you want in most cases. And it's almost always easier and better just to refer to it this way because it's more precise for you. Because then also if the matrix changes shape, that will still work and will still refer to the thing that you want. Yep. These first two are important because they basically tell you how to subset uh, entire rows and entire columns. And they're also used very commonly in data frames, which is going to be the data format you usually use in here. Uh, four comma is, remember, row first, so that's fourth row. Comma four is row then column, so this is fourth column. This also then in a data frame means the fourth variable. So if you need to return the fourth variable and you don't want to name it, you just want to number it, then that's how you get it back. A lot of common functions used on matrices. Row sums you use, I think you use all of these. Maybe you didn't use means. You definitely use sums, uh, row sums, call sums, and you definitely use binding, row bind and column bind. So both of these uh, are really common ways to add new cases. If you need to just add one new case, you're probably gonna R bind on an existing data frame. Maybe you forgot a case, or you got one new, uh, you know. If you imported a data frame and you forgot, oh, we've got one more participant, it's probably, it may or may not be worth it at that point to go back to your original data source, change, you know, the Excel file or whatever it is you collected data in, re-export it in the formats that R will read, and then reread it. You might instead just want to call C-bind one row, or R-bind one row. Ugh. The uh, row means, call means uh, are really easy ways to summarize. Uh, R-O sums and call sums also. Uh, one thing that is sometimes screws people up is this S. If you do call mean, it won't work. So you have to have call me. All right, factors and lists we already talked about. Uh, but going back to lists, you really don't want to create lists unless you need to keep dissimilar information together. If it can be a vector, it should be a vector. Because as soon as you get to lists, things get a lot more complicated. Uh, an example of a list is a data frame. A data frame is actually a special kind of list. So remember, a key aspect of lists is they allow dissimilar data types to be put together in one variable, right? What do data frames have in them? Lots of dissimilar data types, right? You might have a variable that's integers, you might have a factor variable, you might have a numeric variable, etc. Each of those is an item in a data frame list. So I'm going to combine uh, a couple of vectors together and create a data frame real quick. Uh, example data frame is going to be data dot frame, and we're going to combine. Can't press enter apparently. Uh, five through ten and ten through fifteen and a b c d e. Where did I count off? Oh, 10 through 15. No. no I did it again. Oh. Whoopsie. There we go. I just did it myself. That was an off by one error. So, I just made a data frame. We're going to we're gonna traverse this data frame a little bit, which is a fancy way of saying looking around it. This has weird names. Uh, how would I change those names, by the way? Do you recall? Names. Yeah. So we go names, example, df, gets what data type does this take?
vector, the string vector of, uh, let's call it x and y and z. There we go. So now we have a data frame uh, with an x, a y, and a z in it. So what happens? Example df1. First variable. Why is that confusing? Because if this were a matrix, it would only return the first value, 5. If this were a vector, it would return the first value, 5. But because it's a list, it returns the first, it's a special kind of list, it returns the first variable instead. That's weird behavior. This is one of many reasons why programmers do not like R, because it acts a little weird. That's not consistent between the different data types, but it's something you have to remember. So when I return number one, I get back that one variable. Now because it's a list, what happens if I do that? So remember the difference between extraction and subsetting. When I use one set of brackets, I'm subsetting. So that's returning a data frame, but with only one variable in it. When I extract, it returns a vector. See the difference? So the reason that's super important is because, say for example, you wanted to throw one variable into another analysis, but that analysis requires you to give it a vector. That means you have to convert it to a vector before you send it to it. Every function in R expects a certain data type or set of data types. So being able to convert between them freely is very important. Okay? So what do you lose when you get a component? You lose these labels. We have row labels, which are just numbers in this case, but they could be anything. And we have column labels in the data frame. You don't have those in vectors. Vectors don't have labels. Let me see the difference. Really remember this. Single versus double brackets, another common place where people get real frustrated. Because they will say, for example, all I have to do is pass this variable to this other function and get what I want, and it will not work. And the reason it won't work is because you'll send it a data frame instead of a vector when it's expecting a vector, or you'll send it a vector when it's expecting a data frame. So you have to pay attention to what the specific command you're trying to execute expects, and then make sure that you send it that. Remember, nothing is automatic in programming. Okay? If it wants a vector, you have to figure out how to send it a vector. Okay, so let's continue experimenting here. What then happens if I do that? 510A. Why? How would you pronounce this? Get accustomed to saying the whole thing. Subset of example underscore df row 1. So then the other one should be a lot easier. What does that do? Subset of example df variable 1. Note a difference in behavior, again. When I return an exa a row, it deconstructs it down to a vector, which it did not do when I did this way. When you're coding, when you know you need specific data types, don't even bother memorizing this. It's, it's just pointless. There's so many little random things that R does like this. What you instead need to do is be aware that things like that happen and test it before you actually write the code. So if you need, if you need to refer to a row, then just jump down to our console and type this until you get the one you want. Eventually it will become second nature. Eventually you won't think about it anymore. But while you're learning, test everything. Don't just, it's just like in data camp, don't just write a program, run it, and see if it works. Test it piece at a time to make sure each individual element, each row, gives you back what you think it should give you. And if it doesn't, then you have to fix that first. Programming is in many ways like solving a giant jigsaw puzzle, right? There's an end goal you're trying to get to that involves taking all of these little pieces and getting them all to work together just right. So don't try to build the puzzle all at once. Do it in, in clumps, in pieces. Take each individual requirement and do them one at a time. The, uh, the other way that you'll see to refer to this, which might be a little bit easier, uh, is with the dollar sign. Uh, this also returns variables. It is functionally identical, uh, however, to this guy right here, to, to, to extracting. So we've already, we've talked about all the data types, we've talked about all of uh, the atomic classes, we've talked about all the variable types, which is different.
variable types, data types, different things. Uh, variable types operate within data types, so you can have vectors of characters, vectors of numerics, etc. That should all make sense now. Uh, we've been using functions. We haven't really called them functions. I don't think that the lessons actually use the word function anywhere. Um, all a function is, is when you have some sort of command, like cbind that I just rewrote, parentheses, and then some other numbers. That's a function. Those pieces inside the parentheses are called parameters, and they assign different things back to the function. If we go back over to R, we can get all sorts of information about functions. Let's do row sums. Using that question mark I showed you last time. It's going to give you all sorts of information about what happens. So, when I use row sums, for example, this tells me that it takes three parameters, x, na.rm, and dims. Okay? These equal signs right here mean that these are defaults. So if you don't put in na.rm, it will use false as the value. That's what that means. You have to then go down to the argument list to figure out what those parameters do. So if you know, for example, that you need to use call sums for some reason, but you're like, I don't know what that does. I don't know what it takes. I know nothing about it. This help file tells you all of that. Right here, you can see x is an array of two or more dimensions containing numeric, complex, integer, or logical variables. So array is a way to refer to any multidimensional set of information. So that could be a matrix or it could be a data frame. And it tells you what type of data types it will look at. So you need either a data frame or a matrix containing numeric, integer, or logical values. So that's what you need to format whatever it is you're doing in order to give it to X. Okay? And again, you can use this here as a matrix because a data frame is a list that acts like a matrix. Very frustrating. But it would work here too. You can also see NA.RM. This is actually remove NAs, which really means remove missing values. Uh, by default, it's set to false. You can see should missing values, including non, which means not a number, which does, it happens when you do things like divide by zero or mathematically impossible things. Uh, be omitted from calculations. By default, the answer is false. It will throw an error if there's missing values present. Uh, and dims is the dimensions are, are treated as rows or columns, and you can see more information about it there. In practice, you don't probably won't need to bother with secondary parameters unless the function is not doing what you want it to, and then you should look into it. Anything that doesn't have a default value, you have to put in or it will throw an error. So you can see only the x is required. And that's the way you did it in lesson two. Uh, you did it as row sums, parentheses, thing. And it spits back row sums. Okay. We can do it here. Example, yeah. Uh-oh. I have to matricize it, don't I? Man. No, I can't matricize it either. Oh, I can't do sums because there's a, a, a through f in there. Mm. So if I do this and subset by uh, variables 1 and 2, there you go. And then we get row sums. Man. So hopefully that logic, what I just went through in my head, made sense, because that's what you're going to be doing a whole lot. So if something doesn't work, interpret, try to figure out what's going on, run multiple tests, and get down to which one. So in this case, where did those values come from? What are those? Yeah. Well, again, read this. Sums of rows in example DF subset by columns 1 and 2. So that took those two columns up there, 5 plus 10, 6 plus 11, 7 plus 12, and so on. That's where that came from. And it returned it as a vector. which we can see down here under value, it returns a numerical complex array or a vector if result is one-dimensional. So in this case, it's one-dimensional, so it returned a vector. Everything about how this thing works is in this help file. If you're real curious and you really want to know how something works, you can type it out without parentheses, and it will actually give you the original code that is used to run it. So this is the function row sums, and you can see what it does. 
if a function does weird things for you, and you're like, I don't understand why it's doing that, you can actually try to trace back through its own programming what's happening. This is a way that uh, people will help fix stuff in R. The open source community is very alive in R. We talked about that last time. Uh, this idea that individual people contribute new packages, new functionality to R all the time. Uh, so they look at, well, not row sums, because this is a very foundational function, but they'll look at other people's code and say, you know what, it doesn't work quite like I expect because this is wrong, or this is not what I would want, or I would want more functionality here, and they will write their own versions of all these code. But again, you could rewrite row sums for yourself if you wanted to. If you're like, you know what, I don't like it that it returns vectors, I'm not going to do that. You could change this so that it doesn't. Again, the flexibility of R. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Uh, time. Uh, we're doing all right. Comments. You saw a lot of comments, but never wrote one. You were never actually instructed to write a comment. The general rule in R for comments is just use a hash. Okay. So we're not gonna we're not gonna use that in the console. But if I was in an R script, then I could say we're gonna row sums this thing, and this command won't work. That is a comment. You will need to get used to commenting your own code because what you wrote today, you will probably not remember two weeks from now. You will look at that code and it will be as if someone else wrote it. That's a very common experience. So get used to commenting sections of code uh, to remember what they do. Uh, I will show you yep, an example. So this is the kind of commenting that I do. It's not a project that we're actually doing. Uh, this is just to remember what these packages do. Uh, this is to give myself notes so that if I have to re-import a data file later, I'll remember what it was supposed to look like. Uh, and then just a general description of what functions do. And then this piece right here is commented out because I, when I was testing, I only used, what does that mean? Rows 1 through 10. And when I actually ran the program and I wanted to write it with the full 1,500 rows, then I commented that out and reran the program from the top. If you hit Control Enter on a comment, it will just skip down. So you can Control Enter, 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 and just run your program, and it will skip any comments. So that's the kind of commenting you should do. You don't want to comment every line. Some lines are self-explanatory. So, for example, when you just looked at that, you know for yourself that's rows one through ten because you know R now a little bit. So you don't need to write this subsets row one through ten. Some people will do that. Please don't do that. Okay? So anything that's self-explanatory, you don't need to comment, but everything else, it can be pretty helpful. Uh, oh, one thing to remember, too, with these is that comments don't need to start on their own lines. I can, for example, do that, and that will still run. So if you just want to comment one line, uh, you can do it this way. In practice, sometimes people will do comment lineups. So other thing, yes, and they will tab over so that all of their comments line up, which makes your, your code more readable. Readability is very important for code, because if anybody else or a later version of yourself comes back and tries to read it, the better you formatted it, the easier that will be. So you can do that kind of format uh, so that all the comments are lined up, or you can do it in individual rows, doesn't matter. Uh, as a reminder, also, in R, Control-Shift-C will comment everything that you're currently highlighting. Very useful if you want to comment in and out blocks of code. Remember your keyboard shortcuts. Be actively working on them. And it's also there. Great. Yeah. If you had it highlighted in the Control-Shift-C, will it only do that section, or will it still comment out everything? It will comment out everything that you've highlighted. So right here, yeah. Uh, another little useful key, uh, which I sometimes forget, and I'm pretty sure it's I. Yes, it's Control I. If you have a huge amount of code and you have moved around uh, parentheses and other things, uh, and you're not really quite sure where everything is, you can highlight that entire section and hit Control I, and it will re-indent everything for you. The way indention works is that every time that a function has a bunch of stuff in a group after it, you indent. So you can see right here, we won't, we'll do this next time, but not, not for this week. You can see this bracket, this curly brace right here. 
That means that everything that occurs after that point is inside this command. So that's so there's an indention. But then there's another curly brace right there, which means we're going in another level. We use indention as a way to visually remember all of that. R doesn't care. If you put all of that on a single line, R would still handle it just fine. Probably. Yes, with that one it would. That's not always true. R would handle all of that just fine on a single line, but for your readability as a human, we use new lines and we use uh, indention. So just remember that as we move forward. All right. So what we're going to do, the new skill for today, uh, which will be important for your project, is how to actually use RStudio. So has anybody actually played around with RStudio at all yet? Or have you only been in data camp? A few people? Okay. So this is our studio we've been, that we've been doing, uh, dealing with. For each project that you do, and you can do it now if you want, for each uh, weekly project, you're going to create a brand new RStudio project using that new project command. You're going to create a project in a new directory. You can create an empty project in that directory. This page is a little bit weird. Oh, and if, if, if you don't know what a directory is, it's a folder. They're the same. What we're going to do here is create a project as a subdirectory of something and then create the, subject and create the directory name in different places. So if you, I would recommend you just put them all in one place next to each other and then just create new directory names for each week's project just as a way to keep organized. Uh, after, and also make sure if you have Git installed, you'll be able to check that box to create a Git repository so you can commit the uh, stuff that you're working on. I'm not going to do that right now because I already have one. That will create uh, this interface and what I would, without these folders. And what I would like you to do in every single project is create these five folders within your project. R, data, output, docs, and figures. It's a good habit to get to stay organized in R. So what each of those does, R is where you will put R files. When you write code in R, it will save by default with the data format .r. And okay? all of those files should go into R. Data is where you will put raw data files. That's SPSS files, Excel files, CSV files, whatever they are, go in data. Once you have put a file in data, it should never be touched again. You should not save things to data. You should not change files that are already in data. Once you put a file in there, leave it there. Don't mess with it. Output is where you will save stuff. So if you create a data file, you do some analyses on it, and you save something from it. Output, if you save new versions of data files, whatever it is, those always go to output. And we'll talk about how to actually do this in a minute. Docs is where you put reference material. So if, for example, I give you a PDF related to what you're talking about, if I give you a special cheat sheet to refer to, whatever it is, that all goes in docs. And figures is your other output folder. That's for when you create figures using RStudio and R. So always create these. The easiest way to do that here is this new folder button once you have a project open. You can, however, just go find the folder and do it there. It's the same thing. So you will notice a couple of files get created automatically. That is the rproj file, gitignore, and rhistory. rhistory is a list of everything that occurs up here. You will get a full re recounting of everything you ever did in the console recorded as a text file in this history file, and that will also be saved as a file. So everything you tried will go in there. Gitignore is a list of which files should get ignore. So that makes sense. Git ignore doesn't want to record git ignore, for example, so you will never commit a git ignore file. You can actually modify that on your own if you want to change which files appear when you look at git in that git uh, tab up there. Otherwise, you can just ignore it. And you will also occasionally see a workspace file here if you save your workspace when you're done, or if you save as workspace or whatever else. So what's important about this and what we need to talk about now is how do you actually navigate all this stuff First, I'm going to create a. That is next, right? Yes. First, I'm going to create a new R script. 
I'm going to save the blank file, save as, that was alt F A by the way. I'm gonna go into the R directory and I'm gonna call this example. It's gonna save it as example.r and it's gonna appear down here. Everybody see that? I put that specifically into the R subdirectory. Now, this, um, this creates a problem if we need to refer to folders that are not the R folder. Okay? R, R Studio operates on a principle called working directories. And the working directory is where everything that, if I need to refer to the file system, where is stuff? So for this, once I have this file open and saved, I can go to session, set working directory, to project directory, or to source file location. You're going to want to set it to source file location. Okay. That's going to create a command. It's going to run down here. You can see in this case where that ended up looking like. Uh, and it's going to point to R. This is where there will be a PC versus Mac difference. Possibly. I'm pretty sure. If you need to refer to a file, you have to do it via a string in R. You can see right here what that directory structure kind of looks like. This is a string. You see the quotes, right? So this is a character vector. So these strings points to uh, tilde, which really means your home directory. Slash, in this case, teaching course name, example projects, which to example R. Okay. If you need to refer to files relative to where you are now, you use a dot. Single period. So tilde refers to your home directory. Don't do that. Instead, use a dot. So a string referring to my current directory, for example, would look like dot slash. Make sense, everybody? If you need to refer to one level up, the parent directory, you would call it, we use dot dot. So I'll write these out. So this is current directory, and this is parent directory. So, if my working directory is set in the R folder, how would I refer to a data file called data.csv? What string would get me there? So from the current working directory, we would cut back to the parent directory, which is the project folder. Then we would jump down into the data directory, and then we would look for that file. So that string would get us there. Why do it this way? Yeah, not just a different computer, if you just move it. If you have hard paths, which is what this is, if I decided later, you know what, I don't want to have this here. I'm going to move it somewhere else. Then suddenly this code breaks because it's not there anymore. If you use relative pathing, which is what this is, if you always refer to it in relation to the R file you're looking at, then everything will always be in the same place as long as you have this project structure in place. When you submit projects, you are going to archive up and create a zip file of your entire project directory and submit it. So for it to run on my computer, it is very important that you do this. Okay? So always use relative pathing. And you'll have an example of that in this, this week's project. Okay? That makes sense to everybody. Very important. If I wanted to save a figure, and I wanted to call it, well, no, if I have a figure. If I wanted to save text, if I wanted to save a file called my.text, where would I save it? Mm. Output. Remember what your structure is. Docs is for documentation, so that's stuff that informs your project. Output and figures are the only things you ever write to. So output is for everything that's not a figure, and figures is for figures. Okay? Everybody clear on pathing? All right. So the last step uh, when you do this is going to be to actually create um, the archive. On a Windows machine, that's pretty easy. What you're going to do is find that folder, 
highlight everything, right click, and go send to compressed folder. That will create a zip file. It will give you a warning if there are empty directories, which is fine. And then you're going to just name that your last name and the week. And that folder, that file is then what gets sent on Blackboard. Make sense to everybody? If you're on a Mac, I think that's a little harder. But that's it. When you open that, you will notice that some of your directories disappear, and that's okay, because zips do not contain empty directories. So in this case, we only have a file in R, so that's the only thing that came back. But that's fine. This is the file, then, that you submit. That enables me to see a variety of things about uh, your project. Uh, that lets me see your, your history, all the things that you did, so in case you did something wrong, I can try to diagnose why. Uh, if uh, it shows you the R, it shows all the input data, it shows all the output things that you create, it shows everything. So I'll be able to get a full accounting of where problems occurred, if any problems occurred. What's going to happen every time you submit a project is I'm literally going to just open that project file and hit run, 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 run. And I expect to see the output that I get on my project in yours. And if they're the same, you get 100. That's how this works. If they're not the same, then I will try to figure out why. Uh, if individual pieces are wrong, uh, then I will attempt to do kind of a partial credit -y thing. Like if you make a mistake early on, it screws up later stuff. Um, that's not always possible, depending on how screwed up it is. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but that is, that is how I do these evaluations. So make sure you can create zip files. Make sure that you use the correct project structure. And make sure that you use relative pathing so that all of that works.